Okay, uh, so I hope everyone had a good weekend. Um, today, um, we begin the, I think the seventh week of the course. I've, I've really lost track. Uh, yeah, we begin the seventh week of the course today. Uh, and I think for many people, this will be their favorite week. Uh, based on the feedback I asked for last time in the quiz, uh, it sounded like most people had uh, enjoyed the graphing week the most. And um, I think the graphing week was very visual and uh, had lots of sort of interactive parts to it. So, um, so, so today we're beginning the, the topic on geometry, as you can see from this quote here. Uh, so geometry is very visual. And in fact, it's, as I mentioned, uh, as I hinted, with the introduction to trigonometry that we had last week, uh, geometry and trigonometry are the most ancient forms of math. And this is a great quote by Isaac Newton, who wrote the, I mean, who did many things in method calculus and modern physics and um, wrote the Principia. So the Principia was written in, I think, this very year, uh, 1687. And he basically said, uh, th this is from a, one of uh, the, a tremendous physics textbook by Kip Thorne, who was a Nobel Prize winner a few years ago. Uh, he, he quoted Isaac Newton. Uh, Newton said, geometry postulates the solution of these problems for mechanics, namely the, the problems Newton was solving, like planetary motion and uh, law of gravitation, these kinds of things, and teaches the use of the problems thus solved. And the problems thus solved were, um, you know, the, the problems that uh, yeah, like Galileo had, had, had discovered, you know, we, we talked about last week, you know, Galileo had talked about how things, you know, if you roll something down a ramp, that there's uniform acceleration, so on and so forth. Uh, and geometry can boast that which so few principles obtained from other fields. It can do much. So um, what Newton was talking about here uh, is, is actually very profound. And uh, there is this effort in the modern physics community uh, and engineering and math communities to mm, sort of the culture these days is to express things geometrically because a geometric understanding is coordinate invariant. In other words, a geometric understanding of the world does not depend on where you pick your coordinate system. It doesn't, it doesn't necessitate the use of a certain coordinate system. Um, so, um, so, so geometry, yeah, it's, it's, it's actually very tied to the physical world. And we are going to see uh, it's more than just uh, idealized shapes. It's actually, um, it's very helpful in, in, in solving real world problems. So let's just do, I've done this at the beginning of each week, really taking a course, taking an inventory, an overview of where we are in the course, and then introducing the new topic in relation to all of these things. So we started the first three weeks really of the course was uh, devoted to algebra. And we talked about linear equations, uh, quadratics, exponentials, logs, what, you, what happens when you transform these functions, absolute, you know, absolute value, uh, so on and so forth. Um, we also talked about solving systems of equations. That's a huge field of algebra, uh, you know, by the name of linear algebra. We talked about, um, even recently, you know, with trigonometry, we talked about how trigonometry relates to algebra. And so that, that is denoted by this arrow here. You can see that all the subjects here, besides algebra, I should have really drawn it. Algebra and calculus are less related. The language of calculus is algebra, in a sense. Um, so less, less of a thing to talk about. But, uh, okay, so we talked about algebra. We talked about physics through our discussion of dimensional analysis. That's been the only real physics we've talked about. Uh, besides our examples, right, we've also had several examples from the physical world, like the log, uh, logarithmic spirals of uh, galaxies, the sh you know, the shapes of galaxies, so on and so forth. Calculus, we, we, you know, this is not a real topic of the course, but we talked about, um, you know, elementary differential equations. We talked about the notion of the derivative. We talked about, I think we talked about the integral through, you know, through our Idea. So anyway, so we've covered very little of calculus, but we've talked about it nevertheless. And last week we talked about trigonometry. And of these things, algebra, you know, algebra was uh, really um, 
the work of the Arabs and, and the way, oops, sorry. Uh, algebra, anytime you see AL in front of a word, al, you know, AL, the, uh, some of you might know Spanish and the use of these pronouns, uh, not pronouns, uh, the use of the articles L and LA, right? Th these are basically, uh, this is the masculine version of the and the feminine version of the. So, so these are um, articles, right? Um, but um, the Arabs used uh, all, and so uh, so anytime you see all, so there's the, you know many names of stars are because the Arabs were great at astronomy. So if you are into stargazing, you'll see that there are stars like Al Dabaran, for example, or Al Farats, and, and so anyway, the list goes on. Lots. Anytime you see Al, you should think of the Arabs. So the Arabs were really the, the masters of algebra. Uh, the Greeks really were. Um, champions of trigonometry. Uh, and these two are definitely the oldest forms of the subjects that we know, uh, the subjects that we call algebra and trigonometry. Physics was sort of a vague subject until uh, Newton came along. So, so physics changed drastically, developed drastically upon the invention of calculus, and therefore it's a newer field. And it's not really math either. You know, this, this entire box denotes the field of math. Um, so the oldest of all of these things is what we're going to talk about, and that is geometry. Geometry is the most ancient form of math, and it's also the most profound form of math because it relates to reality without, with minimal, uh, you know, ad hoc definitions. We again, like I said, we don't define coordinates, we don't define um, axes. You know, we don't have to do any of that stuff. Uh, we just have a very minimal set of rules about the space we're working in, and everything else follows. And so uh, I think this will be similar to last week, a trip back in time, right? So we're not, I'm not going to cover as much history as I did last time, but I did want to talk about how uh, this fit into the, the form of Greek learning. So the Greeks, they had upper and lower division courses, right? In, in the ancient Greek education system. And th these were the lower division courses. And these were sort of the upper. So this is like high school for the Greeks. And this was like, it was more sophisticated than that. It wasn't, it's not a perfect analogy. But the trivium is sort of like what you're doing in your English class. They covered rhetoric, grammar, and logic. So rhetoric is like how to say things in a convincing way. Grammar is how to structure your words so that they make sense. And logic is how to use words to construct an argument, right? To convince someone of something. And these, the Greeks said, in order to, to move on to the quadrivium, you would have to master these things. So you'd have to be very good at speaking and very good at writing and reading and convincing people of things. And, and then you would move on and you would study arithmetic. So this is like, you know, real old school. This is like what you learn in first and second grade. I mean, like adding numbers, you know, multiplying numbers, just basic operations, right? The Greeks, uh, this did not include as much of what we think of as algebra, right? This is before really algebra was a popular way of seeing the world. Uh, arithmetic, music, so the Greeks spent lots of time on music, um, astronomy, and uh, geometry. And um, really, uh, each, each of these actually, I, I was not expecting I would tell you this because it's a finer point, uh, but each of these things also had a spiritual side. So, so these were the academic disciplines. And each of these things had a more spiritual or like um, personal side that, that is really interesting. Uh, for arithmetic, there was numerology. This is the belief that, that numbers have mystical power. Um, for geometry, this was the study of the heavenly bodies. And this is what inspired people like Johannes Kepler to make uh, different models of planetary motion based on elementary geometry. Um, astronomy, the, you can guess, astrology, right, was this, the personal uh, sort of pursuit, astrology, astrology anyway. Uh, music, um, wow, what, what was the one for music? I, I'm forgetting. This should, I should really know this one. Um, let, me, let me get back to you. Um, I forgot what the one for music is. But anyway, each of these things, it's hard to imagine because music is already so personal. Um, anyway, uh, that's, that's too bad I forgot. It's, I, I don't think it's musicology. Um, I, I have a teacher who told, actually one of my really good friends told me this. 
so I should ask him. Didn't learn this in a class. This, anyway, this is just interesting. So geometry is, you see where it fits into the context. I mean, if you imagine this week that you're also studying these things and you're studying it with the sort of uh, passion that the Greeks did, uh, I think you'll get a lot out of it this week. And indeed, the, the sort of um, culture of geometry influenced people all the way up into the present. Um, and in the medieval days, um, this is a little clip from Wikipedia, uh, not the most academic source, but I think it's still good. Um, for most medieval scholars who believe that God created the universe according to geometric and harmonic science, particular geometry and astronomy, was linked directly to the divine. Uh, to seek these principles, therefore, was to seek God. And uh, this is really what people thought. I mean, you, it, it's hard to uh, study physics and study the work of Galileo, Kepler, Newton, and others without recognizing how much of a spiritual pursuit their work was. They were very much like, uh, if you read the work of Kepler, Ke I mean, Kepler was very like influenced by ideas and theology and Newton as well. It's really amazing. In fact, uh, as an aside, Isaac Newton, when he invented calculus, he did this during the bubonic plague, which is similar to what we're experiencing now with the virus. The mm -hmm. virus. Newton went home, he was in college, uh, and he went home because of, just as we all did, right, to uh, quarantine, so to speak, right? Uh, and I could have done it. He, during, when he went home, he... I was sweating last night. Okay, I'm going to mute. Yes, the cool. Okay, when, when Newton went home, he invented college. So, so anyway, high um, bar to, to me. Okay, so let's let's start with shapes that we've seen in the course so far. So if you think about the progression of our development here, we have, you know, we, we have talked about algebraic shapes. So, we, you know, we've seen graph, you know, we've graphed things, and I'd like to relate what we do know to sort of where we're headed. So can anyone, so just anyone start, um, tell me about the shapes we've seen so far. For example, what is this? You'll have to unmute yourself if you want to talk because I muted everyone. What is the name of the shape? That's a zero D. Or that's a one D. Hourglass. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about the blue shape. This literally, it's just a, I feel like line. I can use it. Yes, it's just a line. Okay, so we've talked about lines. What else have we talked about? Think about a zero dimension. What is a zero dimensional shape? We've, talk we've talked about points. Sure, we've talked about points because we've graphed them, you know, on an XY plane and so forth. What are other shapes? We've talked about many. Parabolas. Very good. Uh, keep going. Circles. Say that again. Circles. Circles. Good. We, we have quite. Um, we actually, we, we talked about circles when we talked about polar coordinates. Remember how easy it is to graph a circle and polar coordinates? And I gave you the equation for it. So we briefly talked about circles. Very good. And there are two other breeds of shapes that I don't expect people to know because we haven't talked about them. But we have definitely talked about these four. And those other two shapes are ellipses. And does anyone, I don't know. Hyperbolas? Yeah, hyperbola. So, okay. So whoever said that I know has already gotten the lesson I'm about to do in the next five minutes. So, but thank you. Yes, hyperbolas. And so what are these shapes? Where do they come from? And why do they all, you know, why have I listed them all together here? Well, it turns out that all of these shapes are projections of a cone. And when I say cone, I mean, um, I mean a cone and it's sort of symmetric cone, so, so really two cones, but if you, took, if you took this cone here, like a party hat cone, and you reflected it, you know, across this tip, um, this collective shape, which is like an hourglass, sure, you could call it an hourglass, um, this collective shape, when projected in certain ways, produces these different um, shapes here, right? So I'm going to show you very briefly how this is done. So to produce a point, how can you get a point? Imagine that I, that I had a jar of ink, okay, and I, okay, so like a tub of ink, 
and um, I, I was able to you know put a paintbrush in here and and dip various parts just just you know paint this cone in various ways and then I could put the the cone to a piece of paper. What part of the of the cone would I put to a piece of paper to generate a point? How about this little tip here? So if I took this upper cone, I, I you know dipped it to I could dip the entire upper cone, just the tip in this paint, right? Um, this is really not a necessary explanation, but basically if you if you took the you can generate a point just from the upper this tip of the cone, right? Just from here. And you could, you know, you could put that on a sheet of paper and you get a point. So the point is right here, right? The line, well, the line is just this, uh, the, the edge of the cone, right? Either this edge or this edge. So you could just paint the entire surface, you know, just the surface of the, the you could, in other words, immerse just the very edge of the cone in paint and put it on a piece of paper and you get a line. Parabolas, so these are, you know, these are sort of limiting cases. Parabolas, you can generate a parabola by slicing a cone in this way, parallel to the edge. So if this is my edge and I slice the cone parallel so that, you know, these, they're, they're mutually, uh, if you draw a line, that, that line is perpendicular to both, um, both this line and the edge. If, if you slice it in this way, the, the, this is kind of hard to draw, but you can see that I would generate a shape that looks something like this. And this is really a sideways parabola. I don't know if, you, if this is easy to see. But basically, if you have a curved surface, right, I'll try to draw the contours better, and you slice it here, the shape it, so this, you can see that this edge would be curved, and it would fall off like this. So anyway, this is a parabola, you know, and, and you could recognize this more clearly if you drew it head on. Okay. Uh, hyperbolas are similarly created, except the slice is not parallel to the edge, but it's actually perpendicular to the base. So hyperbolas, are formed this way. And uh, let's see if I can, we're not gonna talk about hyperbolas in this course, but they come in pairs. Okay, so they, they end up looking like this. They, they look like Vs. Okay, circles, well, you can get a circle. Um, you can get a circle by slicing uh, parallel to the base. So we, we talked about slicing perpendicular to the base, slicing parallel to the base, like in this plane, this will give you a cross section of the cone, which is a circle, right? Ellipses are generated as such. So if you sliced uh, not parallel, but generally uh, zero between zero and ninety degrees from the base. So if this if this angle with the base is between zero and ninety degrees, you'll get various breeds of ellipses, which are like ovals. Um, so that is a geometric explanation. So all of these shapes, I think this is really cool because you've studied these shapes and we've studied these shapes this entire summer, uh, at least one through four, and they're all derivatives of the cone. Uh, I think that is pretty cool. So, so this is a, this is a, these are algebraic shapes and we have, you know, we have names for all of these things. So this is y is x, this is an ordered pair x, y, this is something of the form y is x squared. This is of the form x squared plus y squared is one. This is of the form x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared. Anyway, I could go on and on, um, but we have algebraic descriptions of these shapes and I'm trying to relate this to geometry. So this is really an introduction. And the simplest of these shapes is a point. And so that is a good place to start because you might remember when you learned how to graph things, um, you know, you, uh, you had points. Oh, and by the way, just as an aside, uh, speaking of ellipses, I would like to share my screen and show you something. Speaking of ellipses, uh, okay, so you all should be able to see this. Let's see here. Okay, so, so there is a comment. This is not related to the SAT, but I do want to plug this. Uh, there is a comment that is called NeoWise, and you can see, uh, I can send this link to you all. It is visible in the mornings around 4.30, but you need binoculars. Okay, so look in the east near the sun. It's visible in the morning and it's also visible at night uh, after once the sun sets until about 10.30. Um, and if you look at its orbit, 
So I'm going down here. If you look at its orbit, uh, you can see its eccentric, you see this line, orbital eccentricity, 0 0.99991, 9991. It's off by one nine. Um, this means that, it's, that the orbit is almost parabolic, but it's barely elliptical. And if you look at its orbit, so this is a model of the solar system. Uh, so Mercury, I'll zoom out a little bit so you can see Earth, you know, Venus, Earth, and this red line is Mars. And you can see this thing's orbit, how it looks like a parabola. Do you see the, the generally parabolic shape? And that is, it looks like a parabola. This is the comet. It looks like it's a parabola because its eccentricity is so high. It's almost one. It's almost, the eccentricity of parabola is one. Um, and if you zoom out, you'll see the outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. And this, this comet, the orbit of the comet, it goes way, look how angular it is in a sense. Its eccentricity is so large. Here's Pluto, the orbit of Pluto. And here is the orbit of the comet. And so it goes way, way out here. In fact, I, can, I don't even think I can fit it in the screen. Um, but it does, uh, let's see here. It does close off actually, believe it or not. Uh, okay, so did, okay, so now you can see it. See where the orbit, it, it actually does close off and it's a huge ellipse. Uh, it goes way farther than Pluto does. And so this is a rare chance in your life it, it, it'll never happen again. Um, you can see the depth here, how, how deep it goes into space. And it's at an angle. Th this will never happen again in our lifetimes. The orbit of this thing is, is 7,000 years. So you're, yeah, we'll be long gone. Okay, anyway, that, that is an ellipse. So, so this is one of the things that Johannes Kepler found that planets move in elliptical orbits. And when you throw something, I, I, this is not really relevant, but when you throw a ball on Earth, uh, those things are, are parabolic orbits. Okay. Anyway, this is tangential, but just uh, an, an aside that I wanted. So, so look for the comet. It's called Comet Neowise. I've been looking every morning. I still have not found it. So I encourage everyone to, to join me in my efforts. Okay, so a point. It's the basis of all geometry. It's the simplest thing imaginable. And I've drawn a point here. And uh, I want you to realize that to think of a point is as hard to think of as four dimensions. In, in the sense that a point is the opposite extreme. A point is as difficult to uh, wrap your head around uh, than, uh, as it is to wrap your head around um, thinking of higher dimensions. Uh, and when we draw points, I've zoomed way in here, you can actually see that this thing still has some width and it has some height. And this is a, huh, this is a point, no pun intended, that I made earlier in the course. Um, but it, uh, it is really of, profound importance. Points, um, to think of a point is almost like to meditate, right? You're thinking of nothingness. Uh, you cannot, uh, you really cannot feel, um, oh, I still on, I'm still on the website. Okay, does everyone see where I'm drawing right now? No. Oh, sh okay, sorry, sorry, okay. I shared the wrong thing, sorry. I should just share my entire screen in the future. Okay. Okay, so now you see this. Okay, sorry, people. Yes. I, left, I left everyone behind. Okay, a point is the basis of all geometry. It's the simplest thing imaginable. And okay, thanks for telling me that that is helpful. Aruhi asks, what happens if the comet crashes into Earth? Um, it's two miles across, which is smaller than the, smaller than the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs, but it would still be catastrophic. But it won't. It's it's not even coming close to the Earth, so no worries. Um, the basis of all geometry is a point. Okay, so what I was saying is that to think of a point is as hard to think of as higher dimensional space because it is nothingness in it. Here, you know, it, it has some width and it has some height, um, but really, a point is is you know, you this is how we visualize points. But when we visualize things, we always give things widths and heights. But to think about a point is to think about nothingness, really. I encourage you to try. And yet, points, even though they're nothing, they define all of reality. We, this is how we model all of reality, through sets of points. Two points, for example, define, define a line in, in a flat space. So here are two points. So here, you know, I'm going to write the number two, and I'm going to draw a line. And you can see that a line is a one-dimensional object. 
So it takes two points to, to define one dimension in the sense that if you had a, an ant traveling or a person, whatever, traveling along, you know, this line, there's only one dimension in which this person can travel, right? This person cannot travel per, in any direction perpendicular or uh, having a component perpendicular to this line. So this person cannot travel in these directions. This is the meaning of one dimensional. It's like traveling along a straight road. Okay, you can't go, you can't go off into the grass. Okay, what do three points define generally if the three points, points are not collinear? Well, I'll try to visualize, I'll connect these points and, may, and maybe you can see that these things form a plane, right? So if you had a being that lived here, this person could go in this direction, in this direction, and in any other direction, you know, this person can have uh, components of motion that uh, are perpendicular to this first direction. That, that the first direction is the direction that was only accessible um, in, the, in the linear case, you know, in the case of a line. So this person can travel. This person has a great, much greater range of motion. But this person, note, cannot travel out of the plane, cannot travel in this direction. So here I'm going to write the number three. Three points define a two-dimensional object. So, so I hope people are starting to see the pattern that two points, right, two points define a one-dimensional object, three points define a two-dimensional object. Okay. Generally, four points, can anyone guess? Can anyone see? Okay, so just do people see the pattern? If two, if two points generate one dimension, three points generate two dimensions, what should four points generate? Three dimension? Yes, very good. And this is the general case. You have to pick four general points. You can't pick them. In other words, if the fourth point you pick is on the plane, then you'll still have a plane. It's possible to have four points that don't define three dimensions, right? If you pick smartly in the sense that you, you pick a point that also belongs on the plane. But generally, four points will not be coplanar. And this is where it really becomes hard to draw. But I'll try to draw a plane through three of these points. Oops. I'll try to draw a plane through three of these points. So here's my plane, and this is where my being exists. And here is a fourth point, right? And so in this, in this type of space, this being can reach his hand out, or he can throw something, and he can hit this fourth point. This is the meaning of 3D, and this is the world we live in, in the sense of spatial dimensions. OK, so here's the number four, and so you can see Four, you know, four points defines three dimensions, three points defines two dimensions, one uh, point defines zero dimensions. What do five points generally define? What dimensional space? Four dimensions. And we talked about how the universe is actually uh, fundamentally four dimensional. And what is the fourth dimension? Time, very good. So uh, you can see that fi five points, which are very simple, right? We, we talked about how points are very simple, how immediately we've uh, just with considering five points, general five points, we've removed ourselves from a world we can imagine. And you can recall from our last discussion, I think our Thursday discussion on graphing, that it is impossible to graph four dimensional space. Right, I, could, I had a hard time graphing three-dimensional space, and, and what you're looking at is a two-dimensional plane, which makes it even harder, right? Because I'm making you imagine that this is sticking out of your screen. Four-dimensional space is uh, even harder because, and I definitely cannot try to do it um, on, on the plane. Uh, it turns out you can graph the shadow, you can graph a projection of four dimensions on three dimensions. Uh, but you need three-dimensional space, so I'd have to do it to you in person. I'd have to show you in person what it looks like. Um, but it is, it is generally, you cannot graph four-dimensional space. We don't have an understanding of it. But we did talk about how there's this thing called the Minkowski diagram that sacrifices one of the spatial dimensions, for example, the z-axis, for time. So we have, you know, say, say we have three spatial dimensions, x, y, and z. So again, I'm making you remove yourself from the plane. This is coming out of the page, right? 
So this line is getting bigger and bigger as you look at it. Let's try to draw the perspective. X, Y, and Z. So Minkowski, who was a great um, physicist uh, in the 19th, uh, 20th century, um, <clears throat> did away with the Z dimension. He said, okay, let's sacrifice the Z dimension for so, so that we can have time, right? And, and um, to do that, Minkowski uh, changed the dimensions of time. In a sense, he, he noted that the units of space is in meters, right, in the SI system, the, the units of space is in meters. And he said, well, the units of time is in seconds, but if you multiply seconds by a velocity, right, velocities in meters per second, if you multiply seconds by a velocity, you'll also get meters. Right. And so Minkowski wanted this because he said, if you're going to graph things simultaneously, like X, Y, and Z, see X, Y, and Z all are in meters, right? They're all in the same dimension. They're all in the same units, right? Um, Minkowski said, well, if I'm going to graph time instead of Z, I would also like time to be in meters. And he did that by multiplying time, which is T, by C, the speed of light. And we talked about how the speed of light is in meters per second. He did the dimensional analysis to show that. So this is actually a convention. Uh, this is just for your enrichment. That is called the relativistic convention, where you define time in meters <clears throat> instead of seconds. So we found that, not we, Minkowski found that because of the finite speed of light, and I, I, you might remember this graph. I, had, I, I didn't draw it in the first thing. But uh, because of uh, the finite speed of light, all of, your, all of the, the past exists in this cone. So this is your entire past. And the way you live your life defines a path in the past. Okay, so say you moved, you went from your bed to your table. You could have done this, you know, you could have hit your kitchen on the way. Anyway, so this defines your past. And this point right here is your present. It's a point. And um, your future, you know, lies, is, is undetermined. Its path is undetermined. Um, but it, but it lies all in this cone, right? You can't go outside of this cone because of the finite speed of light. And you can see that generally, you can see the value of the conic sections that we were talking about earlier, because say you, say you sat in one place, then your, your space, right? The, 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 the sort of shape describing your life would be this, right? And we talked about what an intersection of a conic section is such that the cut that you make is perpendicular to the base of the cone, and that is called a hyperboloid. Hyperbola or hyperboloid if you're thinking of three-dimensional space. Um, if you decide in your life to move, um, you know, at the speed of light, right, that this defines motion at the speed of light because you're, you know, you're going uh, along the slope. The slope here is C, right? If you move at the speed of light, your shape is a, is a parabola or a paraboloid in three-dimensional uh, space. So you can see that the, the limiting cases of the way you can live your life are captured by the conic sections of the Minkowski diagram. So this is, you. so I hope this is rewarding to people. You, we don't know much about relativity and we haven't talked about, you know, much of the science here, but you can understand the geometry, the geometric consequences of this amazing thing that is uh, the theory of relativity. So anyway, th this is all part of a discussion, a longer discussion. I hope I'm not losing people through this. This is all part of this discussion of a point, right? Defining geometry as a series of points. So let's really start focusing now on the geometry you need to know for the SAT. That everything we've been talking about is sort of big picture. Okay, Long has posted a video. I encourage you to see it after the class. Okay. Um, what happens if we have a line through a point. So say I have a line L and I have another point P. What is true about any line that is drawn through this point P? So I can draw an infinite number of lines through this point, right? I can draw this line. I can draw this line. I can draw this line. There is one special line though that I can draw through this point. And that is the line that is, that is parallel to L. I'm gonna call this L prime, okay? The line that is parallel to L is there's only one. So there are an infinite number of lines that intersect this line, right? I can draw many, many, many other lines, an infinite number. But there is only one line that is parallel that will, in other words, never intersect 
so uh, L and L prime will never intersect. And this is one of Euclid's famous postulates. Euclid said that there is only one line uh, passing through a point that is perpendicular, that is parallel to a second line in two dimensional space. And this is the type of geometry that is on the SAT. You will find through uh, your further studies, like in relativity or uh, in physics, that the, the world as we know it is not Euclidean, that the space we live in is actually not flat. And so these postulates of Euclid, while they work in our very uh, you know, meager existence on Earth, traveling at speeds much less than the speed of light and so on and so forth. Euclidean geometry is very successful, but the universe is actually not uh, flat. Okay, so, so, so this is one of Euclid's postulates that, you know, there's only one uh, line that is perpendicular to, uh, sorry, that is parallel to a second line, you know, given a point, you can only draw one such line. Um, another postulate, so, so what I'm, the word I'm saying is postulate, and this is almost, when I say postulate, you should think of this as like a uh, axiom, uh, this is another word for axiom or a assumption, uh, you know, axiom is actually maybe not the best word, but an, assu an assumption about the space we're living. So that there is no way to prove a postulate. It is an assumption about uh, nature. Another famous assumption that Euclid made was that the sum of the angles, right? So, so the, the, um, if I had a, a straight line, a straight line is described by a 180 degree angle. So in other words, the measure of this angle, so this, this denotes angle, some people just draw this. I, I always, for some reason, put this arc here to denote that it's an angle and not just like a less than sign. So the measure of angle APB, right? This angle, APB, is 180 degrees. This is another postulate of, of Euclid, that a straight line uh, captures 180, degree, 180 degrees of angle. Okay, so these are two important postulates. What happens when lines cross? So say I have two lines now, this line and this line, and they cross at this point P. Well, it turns out, I'm going to relabel some of these lines, okay, so it's not as clumsy, so we don't have to, uh, sorry, I'm gonna relabel some of the angles so you don't have to say like angle A, D, P, and angle all. So we, so we don't have to do this clumsy notation. I'm gonna call this alpha, I'm gonna call this beta, I'm gonna call this gamma. These are Greek, right? So this is an angle alpha, this is some other angle that's not equal to alpha, that's beta. And this is yet a third angle, gamma, okay? And I'm going to show you using this postulate that, that the line captures 180 degrees. I'm going to show you that angle alpha equals angle gamma and angle beta, let's call this delta, right? This is delta. Angle beta equals angle delta. And the way I would show this is by just taking a simple sum, alpha plus beta, let me clean this up a bit so you can see more clearly. Alpha plus beta, so again, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, right? These are the first four Greek alphabets, uh, letters in the alphabet. Alpha plus beta is 180 degrees. Beta plus gamma, sorry. Beta plus gamma is also 180 degrees, right? Sorry, my computer is really slow. I don't know, it's not erasing when I tell it to. This is the worst it's been. Um, there we go. Beta plus gamma is also 180 degrees. Does everyone agree? So this is 180 degrees and this is 180 degrees. So now can someone tell me what happens when I subtract these two equations? What do I get? Zero. On the, on the right hand side, I got zero. What about the left hand side? Don't the Bs, the betas cancel, right? You have beta minus beta. So what am I left with? Uh, alpha and gamma. Alpha minus gamma, right? Very good. And can't I rearrange this equation very easily by adding gamma on both sides? And this just gives me alpha equals gamma. So indeed, this angle is equal to that angle. And these are called vertical angles. So anytime you have two random lines crossing, you know that these two angles will be equal. And similarly, I can, I can make a similar sum. It's, it's the exact same argument. I can make a similar sum to show that uh, beta equals delta. So we've shown that alpha is gamma, 
Well, sorry, this computer is really slow. I should get a new computer. I don't know what's taking it so long. But you can make a similar argument to show, uh, so I can say that beta plus gamma is 180 degrees, and that gamma plus delta, so this angle is 180, and this angle is 180, gamma plus delta is 180 degrees. And I can subtract these two things, and again, I get zero on the right-hand side, and on the left-hand side, I have beta minus delta because the gammas cancel, right? And beta minus delta equals zero is the same statement as beta equals delta. And so indeed, these angles are also the same, right? So these are all called vertical angles. And this is a profound result of Euclidean space. Any questions? This is very simple, right? But uh, all everywhere on the SAT, everywhere. How about when two lines are parallel? So say I have this line here and this line. They're parallel to each other. And I have a third line called a transversal. Uh, so this, this third line, AX, right? This, this third line is a transversal. What happens now to the angles? Sorry. Versal. And so, what, what, uh, so, so we know already from our last discussion that when two lines cross, the vertical angles are equal. So this is equal to that. This is equal to that. This is equal to that. So, so, so the, uh, we can make statements about you know, uh, these angles and these angles. But what about this angle compared to this angle? Well, it turns out by the same um, very similar logic that since uh, a line is you know, containing 180 degrees, um, that, uh, let's see here, how, how would I prove this well? Mm. Uh, so so, so we, what, we're, what we're looking for, say, say this is alpha, I'd rather use uh, like Greek letters than random letters um, and say that this is beta. I wanna find the relationship between alpha and beta. Okay, and so, um, how, how would I, how would I prove? So it actually turns out, um, it actually turns out that because uh, it just takes a little bit of sort of gymnastics playing around, but because these two lines are, are uh, parallel to each other, you can imagine moving this line, let's call this line M. You can imagine moving it closer and closer and closer to this line, call it M, N. And until, the, the, until they're the exact same line, right? And the, because they're parallel, the angular measures remain the same, right? So you can, in other words, you can move this line closer and closer and closer and closer. And the angle, these angles are still the same. The angles are preserved because you're not rotating the line. And you can move it until the point that it equals, right? That, that line M approaches line N and becomes line N. And um, basically what I'm saying is that uh, this this angle is equal to this angle, and then alpha equals beta, just by this 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 sort of physical argument of moving this line closer and closer and not changing the angles. You can see that you could superimpose line M and N, and you would have the exact same angles. And so uh, angles alpha and beta. So that wasn't really a proof, but it's I hope rigor in, rigorous enough for you all. Um, so alpha is beta. So th those are called so. Let me use different colors. So, so these angles are called corresponding angles. And similarly, if, if this was, you know, gamma and delta, gamma is delta. These are also corresponding angles. And it's very easy to show now, using what we found about vertical angles, because alpha equals this angle, that this angle and beta, let's call this angle beta prime, beta prime is also equal to beta. And those are called alternate interior angles. Okay, um, you can you can use your imagination. Uh, let's call this. Um, psi, I'm using different Greek letters: psi and psi prime. Psi and psi prime. These are alternate exterior angles. This sorry, this this diagram is getting really messy, but these angles are alternate exterior. So all of these angles are equal. The alternate exterior angles are equal. Uh, the alternate interior angles are equal. The corresponding angles are equal. Um, 
Okay. Okay. So I hope people, I hope this makes sense to people. So generally, if I just drew two lines and a, two parallel lines and a third line going through, so two parallel lines and a third line going through, I can make all these statements that, you know, this angle is equal to this angle, this angle is equal to this angle, right? Um, this angle is equal to this angle. Um, you know, this angle is equal to this angle. Note I'm using different symbols for each angle because each of the angles has a different measure from each of the other angles. But actually, the, the okay. Anyway, you, you all get the point, right? That this angle is actually equal to this angle because they're vertical. So you can just use your logic, but, but um, the names for these things are alternate exterior, alternate interior for these two, um, and uh, corresponding for these. These are corresponding. Okay, so I hope this makes sense. I hope that proof was rigorous enough. How about when three lines cross each other? So when three lines cross each other, generally, you have a triangle. And it would be worth our time because we asked, you know, what are the total number of degrees uh, captured in a, a line? What are the total number of degrees captured in a triangle? And, and by the way, this is the last thing we're going to talk about today, really. Um, there is actually no quiz, but I don't want people to leave quite yet because what I'm about to prove to you is actually really important. Okay, so what are the total number of degrees captured in a triangle? Well, to find this, to find this, I'm going to draw some auxiliary lines. So I'm going to draw this point P here. I'm going to connect this. I'm drawing P such that AB is parallel to, to CP. So when I draw this, this arrow looking shape, this means that these two lines are parallel to each other. In other words, they never touch, even up to infinity. Okay, so if these two lines are parallel, well, we just showed that if I have two parallel lines and a transversal, that the alternate, uh, you know, many, there are many relationships between the angles, right? But certainly we showed that alternate interior angles are equal. For example, this angle equals this angle. And if you think of AC as a transversal, so I'll extend this line so it looks like this, this shape here. AC, you can see as a transversal. And you can see then that the alternate interior angles that would be equal are here and here, right? These are alternate interior. And you can also see, because uh, these are parallel, that BC, this, this line BC, is another transversal. And therefore, co corresponding angles would be angle B here and angle this, this angle PCD. So PCD is equal to B. And angle A here is, angle uh, is equal to um, angle you know, ACP. And so we also know, lastly, that the sum of three angles, and I'm going to call this angle delta, I don't know. Um, the sum of three angles, sorry, not the sum of three, the sum of angles that all lie on a line is 180 degrees because a line captures 180 degrees. And so you can see that delta plus uh, angle ACP, right? So, so this is delta plus angle um, ACP. I'll just write this out plus angle PCD. This is 180 degrees. But, but note through, our, through what we found here that ACP is equal to angle A. So this, I'm substituting that here. ACP is equal to angle A. And PCD is equal to angle B. So I just made these two substitutions. And this is the statement that we want that so look, angle delta plus angle A plus angle B equals 180 degrees. Therefore, the sum of the angles of a triangle uh, equals 180 degrees. So this is a very simple but profound, a monumentous, is that the word? Moment, monumentous? Momentous? I don't know. Uh, it's, a, it's a profound result because this is all based on Euclidean geometry. And it turns out that uh, in space, for example, one of the ways to measure that the universe is not Euclidean it's not flat space, basically, is to make big triangles in huge regions of interstellar space and to observe whether or not the angles of those triangles adds up to 180 degrees. It's that simple. And when things don't add up to 180 degrees, scientists get the sense that the universe is not Euclidean. And uh, I would just like to conclude the lecture by saying that you can generalize this result 
to any polygon. You could find the number of degrees in any polygon. And the way you would do that is by drawing diagonals, right? And a diagonal basically divides. So, so this is the case for uh, an n. So, so for an n, when I say an n-gon or a polygon of n sides, um, that means you can put any number in for n. So when n is 3, you have a triangle. When n is 4, you have a quadrilateral, so on. This is n is 6, so you have a hexagon. Um, you can see here that when n is 6, I can draw three diagonals. And generally, if you draw an n, n gon, right, an, 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 a polygon with n sides, you can draw n minus 3 diagonals. Um, and uh, you can also see that um, an n gon has exactly, um, so, so um, yeah, so, so n minus 3 diagonals, and each of the diagonals terminates at n vertices, right? So, so, uh, so this is, there are three diagonals for, for one vertex, but there are also n vertices, right? So here are three more diagonals. Here are, right, now I can draw some more. So, so there are n times n minus three diagonals total, but I also, when I got to this point, I can't double count this one, right? Because I already counted this. So, so because of double counting, you have to divide this by two. And this is the number, this is the total number of diagonals in an n-dimensional, in, sorry, in an n-gon, in, in a polygon of n sides. And because um, a triangle has 180 degrees in it, generally then, um, You can break. You can break up. You can break up. Uh, so, so you can see just based on this first thing here. You know, here's um, you know one triangle, a second triangle, a third triangle, and a fourth triangle. And tomorrow we're going to discuss how I'm going to call the lecture off today. But um, we're going to find that the sum of the interior angles of a, of a poly of a, of a polygon of n sides is 180 times n minus two. So, so this is the first result that we showed today, and tomorrow I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, prove this to you. Okay, so does anyone have any questions? I'm, I'm gonna. Uh, okay, so there yeah, so there's no quiz today because I had so much to cover, and I wanted to spend more time on the history. Um, but does this make sense to everyone? So we covered a lot. We talked about lines and angles and. The fact that a triangle has 180 degrees in it, and we found the number of diagonals. Did, did this last bit make sense to people? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, so you're free to go. Uh, there is no quiz. Um, you're welcome. Yeah, yeah. Uh, take the rest of the day off, as they say. Not really, but <laughs> yep. Enjoy the rest of the day, everyone. I'll see you all tomorrow. The homework is already posted online, so people can get started.